we have Professor Song joining us today. So we're really excited to hear her talk. And I'm just going to pass it over to our graduate student, Mia Song, who's going to do the introduction. Hi, everyone. Um, it is my pleasure and honor to introduce Professor Shi Song. Professor Song is an associate professor of sociology and a faculty member of the graduate group in demography at University of Pennsylvania. She received her PhD in sociology from UCLA in 2015. As a demographer, Professor Song uses mathematical, statistical, and computational methods to study the rise and fall of families in human populations across time and place. Her current research examines the persistence of inequality across life stages and generations in the United States and China from the 18th century to present with genealogical microdata. Some of her ongoing work measures inequality using colossal amount of text-based data to show how rising inequality is perceived, publicized, and interpreted in both authoritarian and democratic societies. Professor Song's work demonstrates not only the value of data in different forms, but also the power of mathematical models and statistical methods. As a quantitative methodologist, she has developed the time varying matrix model for kinship network, Markov chain demography models for genealogical processes, population estimation methods for overlapping lifespan between generations, multivariate mixed effect models, for inter- and multi-generational data and weighting methods for reconciling prospective and retrospective mobility estimates. Her research has appeared in the leading journals of the field, including American Sociological Review, Annual Review of Sociology, Demography, PNAS, Sociological Methods and Research, and many else. She also received William Julius Wilson Early Career Award from American Sociological Association uh, section on inequality, poverty, and mo mobility this year. Please join me and welcome Professor Shi Song. Thanks, Mia, for this introduction. And thanks so much for having me here. Um, let me share my screen and try to figure this out. Or can people see my screen shared? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. So let's see. Yeah, we can see it now. Okay. Uh, let me make it full screen. Okay, uh, let's see if I can, can people see the changing of the slides? Okay, uh, well, thanks so much for having me here. And it's my great pleasure and honor to uh, share some of my work in progress with you about the role of kinship in racial differences in the exposure to unemployment, particularly during the coronavirus economic recession. Um, so this is my our joint work with Hal Caswell, who is a uh, our mathematical uh, demographer and ecologist at the University of Amsterdam. Uh, before I going on, I wonder. So, uh, should we save all the questions to the end, or I'm okay to be? Yeah, I, I by think um, I would say I, I'll, I'll monitor the chat, and if there's a clarifying question, maybe I can. Um, ask that but otherwise you know don't worry about looking at the chat we'll we'll look at we'll do the questions at the end okay so good? we will end at 1 p.m right mm -hmm. okay yeah okay sounds good so i will talk for about like 30 minutes and i hope we will have enough time for our q a Perfect. Uh, so i started to work on this project um um as we all know, the American economy was significantly uh, damaged during the coronavirus pandemic with loss of millions of jobs. Um, the traditional measure of unemployment or the headline measure is the uh, unemployment rate is typically based on individuals and it's a percentage of the labor force population who are currently not employed but are actively looking for jobs. So over the last 50 years, or almost 50 years, the black-white gaps in unemployment rates has been largely stable 
as the average unemployment rate for Blacks is about 11.8% compared to 5.5% for Whites. And during the pandemic, especially in April 2020, when the unemployment rates are suddenly increased, the unemployment rate for Blacks increased to 16% compared to 14% for Whites. So I have seen some can I, I'm sorry, can I interrupt you for one second? I think yeah. your slides are not um, progressing on our screen. We're still on the title oh. slide. Oh, really? Okay, so, uh, this, let me try to do this again. Uh, We're on a different slide now. Yeah. How can I, if I stop, I will. Share this. That's where you are in your talk. Yeah. So our okay. Can people see my current slide? Yes, I think okay. so. Do you want to try going forward one and just let's see? Sure it works. Okay. okay. Perfect. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so the unemployment rate. I hope so these are just as the numbers I just mentioned are between 1972 to 2019, the average unemployment rates for Blacks is about 11.8% compared to 5.5% for whites. So it's about twice of the rates among Blacks and whites. So during the pandemic, especially in April, 2020, the unemployment rates increased for both racial groups, but more dramatically among whites. So the rates becomes 16.4% for blacks compared to 13.8% for whites. So I have seen some of the uh, news report and also some papers. They say that uh, the black white differences in terms of the ratio of the unemployment rates has declined during the uh, pandemic indicating a decreasing gap in racial uh, disparity, racial inequality in unemployment. But unemployment rates says nothing about the consequences of this event, especially its consequences for the workers' families or extended families. So for today's talk, I'm going to uh, bring us to rethink this measure. And I try to introduce two new statistics that allow us to evaluate unemployment from a kinship perspective. So to put the numbers into context, as we can see, these are just based on my own estimates. The black-white gap in unemployment rates has been quite uh, stable over the last few decades. Even during, say, the Great Recession, so we see this proportional increase in unemployment rates for both racial groups and for more recent uh, years. Um, for example, in 2020, April 2020, we see a declining gap between the two groups and later. So, so our, when employment started to recover, so whites are the groups that first um, went back to jobs. But from this individual perspective, we try to calculate the percentage or proportion of individuals who are unemployed in a population, ignoring the interconnectedness of individuals' lives. So we propose two measures based on kinship. One is to think of the lives that are being affected by an unemployment event or are linked to an unemployed person. So we call this first measure, the total lives affected, which is the average number of individuals whose lives may be affected by an extended family member's job loss. So in one of the recent PNAS paper by Ashton Verdery and a few others, they calculated a similar measure they called the bereavement or multiplier in which they estimated the number of people that will be affected by each COVID-19 death. 
So in our case, we think of unemployment. So it's an economic outcome as compared to our, what they measure is just as a death as an outcome. The second measure, uh, let me see. Why I cannot? Okay. So the second measure is called the total lives unemployed in which we try to estimate the average number of unemployed king in a person's kingship network, regardless of this focal person in the middle, his or her own employment status. We try to understand how many of these persons are extended family member are unemployed. The overall the contribution of this project is to provide a kinship approach to re-examining unemployment. So we will offer a new method based on a matrix kinship model to estimate a person's um, kinship network size and age distributions of different types of kin. It's, and also the, uh, the variation by race. The second contribution is to compile a massive amount of data using vital statistics from the early 20th century to the present that will give us all the fertility and mortality, the vital rates in the past and how that have shaped the kinship network size and compositions that we observe in the present population. And we will also combine this with our employment data from uh, 2020 to see how past the demographic rates will have an effect on the unequal unemployment uh, kinship that we observe for blacks and whites in contemporary uh, society. And the last is we have collected data um, to compare formal demographic estimates with um, the survey estimates. Of course, the survey estimates is not to replicate or is not expected to uh, validate the demographic estimates uh, because the survey estimates are shaped by so many other population processes that are not captured by fertility and mortality, this basic two processes that are used to get the formal demographic estimates. So which I'm going to discuss in more detail later. Before I move on, I, I want to first define what we mean by kingship uh, because this has never been a problem until I started to work on this and I realized that people have so different uh, understanding of what we mean by kingship. So I adopted this definition from Kiffith's classic uh, methods paper or also from his book uh, that defines kingship by reproduction. But I have seen some of the recent publications, they have included spouses also as part of the kinship network, which is not a part of our definition. So here we propose this one sex version of kinship that only links individuals to their mothers, daughters, grandmothers, granddaughters, great grandmothers, great granddaughters, as well as the side branches that include sisters, nieces, our aunts, and cousins. And our Step king are not a part of this, our definition. Our spouses are not a part of our definition. And our, we also define first degree only by reproduction, means that only parents and children are first degree king. But in some of the papers I have seen, and even law documentations, they sometimes also include siblings as first degree king, which is different from our definition. Okay, so our, as I mentioned, the first contribution of our project is to provide a new kinship method that will allow us to estimate the kinship network size by race. So let's first uh, try to think of the very basic uh, population dynamics equation uh, based on Leslie matrix. 
So the overall population size by age groups at time t plus one is a function of the population size at time t that survived to time t plus one, as well as the new members born to this, if it's a closed population, so the new members added to this, as well as immigration. So our definition of the kinship dynamics will follow a very similar logic. So our, I feel like this may not be a really something I need to discuss the classic paper by Goodman, Kiffitz and Panam, especially when I give this talk at this Berkeley's uh, demography brown bag uh, talk series. Um, but I realized that not all the demographers are aware of this classic paper that shows the kinship size of a person, the number of a person's kin, as well as the probabilities that the person has a living kin depends on the age specific rates of birth and death in the past. So Goodman, Kiffitt, and Panam developed this theory based on stable population uh, assumption, assuming that birth and death are constant in the past. And in a more recent paper, so my collaborator, Hal Caswell, proposed a novel application of the matrix formulation of population projection to describe the dynamics of a kinship network based on the Leslie matrix. So he generalized the our uh, goodman kiffitz Panam method to a more uh, border scenario that allows us to estimate not only uh, the number and the probability of different types of kin, but also the age distributions and as well as other properties of this using a more, um, I should say, our elegant or simpler way to represent the dynamics as compared to Goodman, Kiffitt, and Panem. Some of you probably know that it relies on this very complicated multidimensional integral of our fertility and mortality rates in the past. So uh, here I introduce this kinship dynamics are um, in relation to this population dynamics. As you can see that a person's kin consists of a population. So a specific type of kin, say the number of daughters, depends on the survival of daughters from time t to time t plus one, as well as the new addition of daughters between these two time points. So it, the, assuming it's a, uh, uh, there is no immigration, so it's a closed population. So it only depends on survival and are governed by the mortality rates and the birth rates that will show the new addition of king. But some of you may have already realized that not all types of king can be added from time t to time t plus one. So for example, your number of mothers, grandmothers, great-grandmothers, your older sisters, and your aunts older than your mother. So will always just be survived from time t to time t plus one. Whereas other types of kings, such as your daughters and your granddaughters, your cousins, or your younger sisters can be born later after you were born. So are between any two time points during your lifetime, we can see the new addition of some, time, some types of king, but not for all types of king. So we have this subsidy term that is governed by the fertility of a certain type of king. So let me give you an example. If we want to estimate the number of granddaughters of a focal person, so the, this number first is governed by the number of survived granddaughters, right? From your age, say 50 to 51, as well as the number of new granddaughters that were born 
when you are age 50 to 51 by your children, not by yourself. So the fertility rates here is governed by the fertility rates of your daughter. And here the type of king is governed by your, your granddaughter here. This is governed by your, your daughter. And based on this kingship dynamics, then we propose these two uh, equations that will allow us to estimate the total uh, number of kings affected by an unemployed person. Uh, first is our total lives unemployed. It's basically to just uh, add up or the king who are unemployed and from all different ages. Say so if I want to know your our unemployed daughters, so I need to add up all the unexpected unemployed daughters at different ages. And if I want to know your total number of unemployed kings, then I need to add up all the unemployed daughters, granddaughters, or your parents, great grandparents. So all different types of king and from different ages. And for our second measure, we estimate the unemployed king surrounding a focal. So this will be a weighted average. So weighted the number of king by the probability that this king is unemployed. So that is expressed as an age-specific unemployment to population ratio at a specific time. So for some of you who are interested in this method, we have this method paper that first already came out in demographic research this year. Uh, and currently we are working on so our, our packages with our people at the Max Planck Institute because they have already, some of their demographers have already uh, written an R package that will allow people to estimate our different types of king based on the Goodman, Kipitz, and Panem method using the uh, multiple, multiple integrals. And we want to extend it to this uh, matrix approach. OK, now I want to introduce the data. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have compiled a huge amount of data that include all the age-specific fertility and mortality rates by race from 1910 to 2020. The reason is that we use a time-varying assumption that allows uh, this race to vary by time, which means that for person, uh, say this person has a king, the oldest possible age of this king would be, we assume it's 110. So that will uh, requires us to know all the uh, demographic rates over the past 110 years. And uh, some of you may wonder, oh, so why do you need to compile the data? Why you just to, not just to use, uh, say, the data from the human fertility database or the human mortality database? Uh, the reason is that um, the our HMD and the HFD don't have uh, the rates by race. So we have to compile this with the help of our colleagues. Um, and we also compiled unemployment rates uh, from CPS and specifically from the uh, April CPS from 2020. Um, let's see, I cannot change it. Okay. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we rely on a one sex version of the kinship estimates and we use an approximation to obtain the two sex estimates based on this assumption or, or method introduced in Goldman, R. Kiffis and Pollan's paper. So we assume identical male and female rates. So once we get the number of daughters, we times two to get number of children and granddaughter times four to get the total number of grandchildren and great-granddaughter times eight to get the total number of great-grandchildren and so on and so forth to get all the full range of two sex king in our estimates. And in fact, we 
do this partly also because of data limitations, because our, currently we have more complete female data than male data. So our, this is one of the limitations of our estimates that may uh, show a discrepancy between our estimates with if we have a truly uh, two sex version of kinship estimates. And we supplement this demographic estimates with our survey data. Um, we added one question to a nationally representative uh, web panel survey of 2,523 US adults aged 18 and above. So the survey was originally designed to ask Americans attitudes towards coronavirus and their labor market experiences. So it's similar to the GSS. Um, so we added one question that asked the people. So many people lost their jobs or were temporarily laid off during our COVID-19. So we asked them to report how many of their relatives were unemployed during April 2020. And we are uh, specified that what we mean by relatives, those are consistent with our definition of king in our formal demographic estimates. Uh, so we have zero, one, two, three, four, five, and six or above. Uh, so here we are the distributions that shows for whites. So the majority of them have no king who are unemployed, whereas for blacks, so uh, many or most, the majority of them actually have an unemployed king during the COVID. And we were surprised to find out that many people reported six or more our relatives were unemployed during the COVID-19. Okay, so our, let me show you the results. Our, first, I want to bring you back to this traditional measure of black-white differences or gap in unemployment based on the ratio of unemployment rates. As you can see over the last at least 20 years, this ratio has been fluctuated around um, two. Um, and in more recent years, we see actually a decline in the ratio, suggesting a declining gap or inequality in black white our inequality in unemployment. But I, as I mentioned at the beginning, this measure itself may be misleading because it didn't really uh, take into account the consequences of unemployment. So here I'm going to show you first uh, so our first measure of uh, this kingship measure of unemployment by different types of king. So overall, this is, so x-axis refers to age of a focal person and y-axis refers to the number of king and different panels shows different types of relatives or king members. So we see that the, the dark gray lines and dots refers to the black population and the red dots and lines refers to the white population. So overall, almost for all the ages, Blacks have more king uh, than whites, except for parents and for some of ages of grandparents. Um, the reason is, is that Blacks have a higher fertility than whites. So that's why we see uh, more numbers of children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and siblings, say great-grandparents, and nieces, nephews, and our aunts and uncles and cousins among blacks and among whites. Whereas for whites, we see um, a slightly higher probability of surviving parents for whites and for blacks because of lower mortality rates among whites than blacks. And for grandparents, it's interesting to see that our whites have more grandparents uh, than blacks at younger ages, but at older ages, blacks are more likely 
to have surviving grandparents than whites. So we just add up all these numbers to get the overall estimates of kinship network size that shows the total lives will be affected by each unemployment event. And for our second measure, we estimate the number of unemployed kin. And here x-axis or so refers to the age of focal. I first show you adults um, because they can be unemployed and they can have unemployed kin. And later I'm going to show you the results for children. As you will see, the patterns are very different from adults. So overall, it's very interesting that the white black gap in un number of unemployed kin escalates over age, meaning that older people have more unemployed kin in their kinship network than younger people. This is very different from unemployment rates because we know younger people are more likely to be unemployed during the COVID-19 or just um, are in general than older people. For example, the unemployment rates for the age 16 to 19 age group in April 2020 is about 30%, whereas the unemployment rates for the 55 and above group are during the same period was only 6%. But the, our, the pattern in terms of number of unemployed king is reversed meaning that older people are more vulnerable to the potential consequences of unemployment happened in their kinship network. And we also looked at this by the degrees of kin. So the first degree, as I mentioned, includes children and parents. And second degree includes siblings, grandchildren, and great-grandparents. And third degree includes so all the rest of the types of kin. So the black-white differences in the number of unemployed children and parents has been quite consistent or stable across all the age groups. But if we look at the our number of unemployed second degree king or the third degree king, we see the older group, especially the baby boomer generation, they have more unemployed king than our other age groups or birth cohorts. A potential uh, reason is that they have a bigger kinship network size uh, than other birth cohorts. So here is the uh, estimates from our survey that asked individuals to report their number of unemployed king and we compare it with uh, our demographic estimates. So the unemployment rates is about 13% versus 16% uh, for the two racial groups. And the total lives unemployed, so the number of unemployed king is actually pretty close, or, or not too much different between the survey estimates and the demographic estimates. Uh, for Blacks, the gap is slightly higher, but overall, we see that each unemployment touches three fewer lives among whites than among our blacks. Whereas for the total number of unemployed persons, so blacks have about our 0.5, so half a person unemployed in their our extended family networks compared to our whites. Are, as I'm running out of time. So I want to show you here is a census bureau reports based on CPS that shows that about 21.7% of children had at least one unemployment uh, parent in April, 2020. And we extended this analysis based on CPS to include all kinds of kin using our, our demographic estimates and also show how this vary by age and race. So here are just as a, based on the CPS estimates, you see that for white children, about 14% of them have uh, one parent unemployed compared to 17% of black children. 
and most unemployment the racial gap exists in fathers than uh, um, among mothers. But if we look at how this uh, racial gap in the number of unemployed can vary by ages of children between age zero to age 15, we see very little variation by age, meaning that children of different ages are equally vulnerable to uh, having unemployed kin in their kinship network. So on average, black children have about 0.2 more unemployed kin than white kids. So the result is very different from our adults uh, patterns, which show this uh, increasing number of unemployed kin by age. So that older people are more likely to have unemployed kin than younger people. Okay, so let me just uh, quickly summarize the findings. So here are just uh, the key numbers. Um, Black Americans have on average 1.7 unemployed uh, king compared to 1.2 among whites. And uh, each job loss in a Black extended family affects approximately 23 related members of the family through kinship ties but this number among whites is only about 20. So as I mentioned earlier, so each job loss touches three more lives uh, for black families than for our white families. And the economic vulnerability of black uh, adults is not limited to certain ages, but existed from our uh, actually children through are out of the whole life course and escalates with age. And we see a, a more uh, significant age pattern among the older adults and among the, uh, the child population. Here are some of the uh, limitations of our estimates. Um, I, will, I will try to be brief here, but well, uh, for our future estimates, or if data permits, we would like to provide a true two sex estimates. And we only provide our so demographic estimates of unemployed kin, but not really to evaluate the economic support or emotions that people provided to their unemployed kin or received from their uh, other family members if they experience unemployment. So, what do we mean by effect? is really from a demographic sense rather than from an economic or psychological sense. And we have no data for other racial groups and we only show the mean numbers. We don't really show the, uh, the variation or individual heterogeneity in kinship size or age compositions and the outcome variables, for example, in terms of our, the, our unemployment or the economic our uh, shocks that a person uh, receives once an unemployment happens. Uh, so to conclude, I'm going to bring us back to this one of my favorite ASR article by Watkins, Mencken, and Bongards, in which they argue that our demography is a foundation of social change. So we know that our economy may recover at uh, actually, I have already seen like Starbucks and Target and Walmart or are hiring right now. So our economic opportunities may recover very soon, but demography takes a much slower pace. So demography plays a role in explaining the stagnated or even worsening economic well-being of Black Americans. I believe that have been ignored by policymakers and our work news commentators who are now examining the racial gaps in our unemployment or economic well-being. So the national stimulus programs, such as the extended unemployment insurance, they would not dramatically narrow racial disparities in exposure to un unemployment because they only focused on individuals. So one 
implication of our study is to call for future policies or programs um, when they design our policies for high risk populations to take into account not only the workers' own characteristics, but also the compositions of their kinship networks. Uh, I think I will just uh, stop here and then I, I will uh, I welcome your comments, questions, um, and suggestions. Thank you so much. That was such a such a wonderful, really, really wonderful talk. It's also really well timed because our graduate students are just this week learning about Leslie matrices and population oh, projections okay. using Leslie wow. matrices. So this is such a wonderful um, sort of adaptation of that of that formal framework. So um, we have a few minutes for questions. I'm just going to jump straight to the chat and I'll, I'll, I'll just call on, on people. So I think Ron had a couple of questions. Ron, I think your first Can I question. Stop sharing, or um, yeah, either, either way, up to you. Um, okay. You can you can keep it up if you want. Ron, do you want to ask? Maybe your first question was already answered, but you had a, a second one um, as well. Yes. Well, it looks like a wonderful work. Uh, there's some technical questions that came up later that others will ask, but. I, and, and a great deal of work has gone into this. I'm not sure the specific question addressed here is the best target for uh, this work you've done, that is kin and unemployment. And what I'm thinking is, first of all, um, if they're more kin, and this is really primarily an economic impact, then the impact on each uh, Mem kin kinship member is going to be reduced as the number of kin goes up. But perhaps more important, I think of this kin network as a support network. And the broader the kin network, the more people there are available to help mm -hmm. uh, make economic transfers, to allow co-residents of this person so they don't become homeless and all of this right. uh, sort of thing. So thank you very much. Uh, I'll just leave it at that. Yeah, I think that's also uh, something I have been thinking a lot while I was working on this. There is really mixed evidence in the literature because uh, many people have, probably have read this and have seen that our kinship net networks are more knit, are tightly knitted among black families and among white families. Uh, so uh, when our unemployment or other this unexpected life transition happens, so black families are more likely to receive support from their extended family members. But there are also some uh, opposite evidence, for example, from Matt Desmond's work on disposable ties. He showed that our black families and especially poor black families are more likely to rely on those, uh, not from their family members, but from say people acquaintances or those, our friends when those unexpected um, life transition happened because of our their King of Warsaw are have in need of support. So they are less likely to provide support to others when themselves don't really have a lot of economic resources. Um, so there are, well, it it's an empirical question. So I hope I will have more data to test this. Thank you. Um, Ken, do you want to ask your question? Yes, so focusing on single parent families, there are racial differences in proportions of single family, uh, single parent families and uh, the, your multipliers, will give spouses, aunts and uncles, mm -hmm. will, will give all kinds of extra kin to single parent families. And I'm wondering how much of the uh, black white differentials that you see might be uh, eroded by that feature of the multiplication. Right, yeah, so because we rely on all the um, the female are 
descendant lines. So means that we follow mothers and mothers, mothers, daughters and daughters, daughters. So uh, we may overestimate our kinship size. Say if for single parent families, our children lose contact with their uh, the paternal side of their uh, relatives. So well, so this just to give us a biological estimates of their kinship size, assuming that the male and female rates are identical. But in terms of social meaning of what people mean by when they call our families may really vary from family to family and depending on the current family structure. Thanks. Okay. Um, I think we have a question from Don. Don, do you want to ask your question? Yes. I hope you can hear me because I was having some trouble. We can hear you. Uh, you can okay okay my my question was and it was a simple technical question and that may or may not be germane to what you're doing and that is i was wondering whether the quite different uh gender difference in unemployment rates by race yeah. uh would uh, how i was wondering how that might affect yeah. your results and now i have a second question following up on ken what ken just said and that is i wonder whether the the greater attachment of women um, uh, to uh, among blacks, the the the, the gender difference in the attachment to, uh, to family uh, might affect your results. Right. Yeah. Well. So, uh, currently, our, our unemployment rates as only uh, for the average our uh, male and female rates rather than our. Uh, by gender, be, mostly because of data limitations, especially for the older group. So there are very few uh, people who are still are in the labor market. And if we both by age and by gender and by race, and if we use CPS data, so we are, are cutting the data into very small pieces. So we will get really biased uh, our estimates. For example, I remember, we call for one of the age groups, 75 to 80. So our, all the women are, are, are still employed. So the unemployment rate is zero and the male unemployment rate is super high. Uh, that's probably because at a very high ages, there are just a too few people who are still in the labor market. So, uh, but I agree with you. Uh, if data allows uh, the gender differences in unemployment rate can really show us a different story uh, because women are, especially older women, are, and especially among the single parent families are more likely to stay employed so, uh, than compared to our males. So in our survey data, we have seen some of the gender differences. What about the differential attachment to family of black men and black women? Well, right. Well, our, in one of the slides, I, I went by too quickly. Uh, so fathers, especially black fathers, are more likely to be unemployed during the pandemics and black mothers. Or even um, these are only those fathers who live with their children because they can be captured by the CPS. So there is our gender differences in the attachment to the labor force and also uh, to who live with uh, the children or live with other family members. Well, that, it would be in, they, not now because you don't have time, but it would be interesting if you could think through the implications, not uh, um, the implications not only of living with uh, uh, of living with the, the, the wife, but the whole uh, ex attachment of extended families of men yeah, and women. Yeah. And that's what I, I would yeah. encourage you to think about. Right, one way to do that is to use a census data to see multi-generational households and how that vary by gender. Um, but well, yeah, I agree. Thank you. 
Um, I think we're we're at time. The Mia, are the students sticking around for a chat? I have sent out the message. Um, I don't know who we're staying, but uh, I'll stay. For 